Welcome to the Transformative Principle. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. And I want to take a minute and just invite you to look at the possibility of coming up to Alaska and teaching or leading in a school or district up here. If you want to connect with me and figure out how you can make the transition up here, I'd be happy to talk to you. Right now, my superintendent position is open, so somebody who wants to make a change and make a real impact to the people of Kodiak, come on up and check that out. And there's always other opportunities. So please take a minute and connect with me and let's figure out how to get some great educators up here in Alaska. Welcome to Transformative Principle. Today, I am excited to have Zaretta Hammond on the podcast. You're going to enjoy this conversation as we talk about how to be culturally responsive in your teaching and leading. And I think this is a really great conversation. I just want to say thank you for listening to this podcast. It is a labor of love for me. I really enjoy doing it, and it means a lot that you would take the time to listen. So thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind sharing this with someone that you know that would benefit from it, I would greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening. Here's my interview. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am so excited to have Zaretta Hammond with us today. She is the author of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor Among Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. And you can follow her on Twitter at Ready for Rigor or check out her awesome website, readyforrigor.com. And both of those use the number four as the four and ready for bigger. So Zaretta, thank you so much for being part of the podcast today. I'm happy to talk to you. Oh, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We're going to talk about one of the things that I just find fascinating is that is being culturally responsive in our schools. And it's something that is, I think, much easier said than done. And something that I know I stumble over many times. And as we are talking today, I will likely say something inappropriate or wrong or rude or something and not intend to. So if I do, Zaretta, I'll ask for your forgiveness and for our listeners' forgiveness as well. And maybe that can be a good opportunity for us to model how to deal with that when somebody does say something inappropriate or insensitive, especially when I don't intend to. So hopefully you can have some patience with me as as we do that. I think it's going to be great modeling because I think that is, you know, part for the course. You have, you know, the beginning stages of learning something new and I call it the first pancake stage, right? Yeah. You know, the first pancake, nobody wants it. It's all kind of messed up, but you are excited because once you get past that, the good stuff is coming. So that's what we're doing today is a little modeling. Yeah, absolutely. And I make pancakes every Saturday, so I know what the first pancakes looks like. So <laughs> that's a very apt description. Thank you. So I want to talk first a little bit about how this book came to me. I've been in my school district now for two and a half years, and my superintendent has not given us a book yet, but he gave us your book and said, this is what you need to be focusing on. And that was pretty much all he said about it and talked about a whole bunch of other stuff, but really said, you need to get this book and digest it and enjoy it. And uh, I teach in, or I am a principal in Alaska. And so um, we're working with a lot of people from the Philippines, a lot of native Alaskans and a few other small minority groups. But what I've been really enjoying about your book is that it teaches me to approach those groups appropriately. And, you know, I think what would be beneficial is if you gave a brief overview of what your approach is here in this book and what makes it different than some others. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, and I think it's kind of it's a big subject, culturally responsive teaching. And I think you said it right. It's easier said than done. And everybody wants to do it. And I want to start with talking about what it isn't as a way to, to get into the That's a good place to start. And I think too often we think of it as kind of a gimmick, right? Something just to get kids uh, motivated or build their self-esteem. So it's kind of a one-off activity in a classroom. The other thing that we often do is see it as a classroom management, that if we just got those kids to pay attention more, 
um, then things would go smoothly. What we don't often do is focus on the learning part. I believe culturally responsive teaching has the power to help students accelerate their learning. Too many of our students are what I call dependent learners, meaning that they are not able to size up a task and do what needs to be done in terms of apply strategies or make connections or be analytical. And it's no fault of their own. It is because we've kind of undereducated them as part of the inequitable system that's been set up. And I think people really have to understand that this is not an approach that's about students of color or linguistically diverse students being so different, right? Their brains aren't any different. But in our system of education in America, we created a two-tiered system, and we're trying to undo that. That's what equity is about. But the byproduct of that has been dependent students. So culturally responsive teaching, I believe, is a really powerful approach to getting uh, students to accelerate their own learning. And I come to it through the brain science, really showing teachers why it's not a gimmick and how to actually leverage what students bring to the classroom in terms of how they learn best and being able to therefore make learning relevant to them. And once learning is relevant to them, the content is relevant, the ways in which they process information are familiar, then students are engaged. They kind of lean into the work and get excited. And once that excitement happens, kind of learning just snowballs. So you don't have to conjole students once that happens. Here's the other thing I'll say to kind of clarify what culturally responsive teaching is and isn't. Too often, teachers get, and leaders, get culturally responsive teaching confused with multicultural education. So multicultural education is important, and it really is about harmony and creating relationships across difference and getting students to work together cooperatively. So we hear a lot of that. We also hear when we think of this multicultural approach to culturally responsive teaching, you know, if we just get the literature and the books that have protagonists that come from the culture or the racial background of the student, then students will get excited and students will, you know, be motivated learners. And what we know is culturally responsive teaching is different from multiculturalism and multicultural education in the sense that Culturally responsive teaching really focuses on the cognitive development of individual students and how do you leverage their neural pathways to actually complement learning. And multicultural education doesn't do that. So I think that's a really important piece for leaders as they are introducing this work to their faculty to really understand what that difference is and help their leaders understand what it is and what it isn't. Yeah. I, I really like how you set that up and how you really focused on the power that is in focusing on how the brain builds connections. And that's something that I don't totally understand, but something that I'm starting to understand a little bit more. So Melissa Nettle, who's a feed your mind underscore read on Twitter asked where we should get started because it's one of the issues is how do we figure out the right place to start? And maybe we're in a multicultural education where we're reading books that have protagonists that are like our students, but you know, maybe that's a good place to start. Maybe that's not a good place to start. Where would you suggest we start as we become culturally responsive teachers? Yeah, I think you can start in two places. You know, having uh, diverse literature is a good thing always, but it is not necessarily the starting place. I think for leaders really thinking about creating the conditions. So the first step in creating the conditions doesn't have anything to do with what teachers are doing in the classroom. So leaders need to have a kind of a phased approach, maybe two or three phases. So I'd say phase one for introducing this work 
is for the leader to begin to create the conditions for teachers to talk about and think about their diverse students in a different way. So rather than trying to get students just to assimilate, how do you understand some of their cultural ways of being and knowing, and how do you leverage that? So for the leader, it's really kind of building his or her own understanding first and creating a set of what I call counter narratives. Because one of the first things that we have to do in bringing culturally responsive teaching to the classroom or to any school is to acknowledge the dominant narratives that work against students of color or linguistically diverse students or poor students. And sometimes students can have all three of those elements in terms of kind of their identities and who they are and the backgrounds they come from, which makes it even more challenging. So first step is leader, before you're even introducing this work to your faculty, be able to lead from the front at staff meetings, right? create a set of counter narratives that acknowledge that students are more than capable. Because one of the things that undermines culturally responsive teaching is a lack of trust between student and teacher or parent and teacher or parent and school. So the first order of business is to increase the trust, right? Our brains really thrive in, on being in community. And in order to learn at a high level, in order for teachers and leaders to push students to new levels, they first have to have the trust of the student. So the first part of culturally responsive teaching is building relational trust throughout your building and creating a set of counter narratives so that there's not deficit thinking about students and their capacity and not always thinking that those students, whoever they may be, are always going to be at the bottom that we have to see the potential in those students. So leader has to do that. That might take a semester and you're not asking teachers to do anything different, right? But you are, as a leader, actively working to seed this new condition where people are coming to the staff meeting and you're talking about issues of equity or you are from the front of the room saying these counter narratives as new ways of being. All our students are capable. These are the assets that they bring, right? If we are talking about Native students, these are the uh, strengths that they bring. How do we make sure that we are building on. This is the wisdom of the community. How do we make sure that our values are aligned with that that wisdom? What are the uh, negative things that people are saying about these students? And and how do we have a, a counter narrative, a counter statement that allows teachers to kind of move out of a deficit thinking mode? So I think that's phase one. Yeah, could you give a uh, a more specific example of of some of that deficit thinking and what the counter narrative would actually look like? And for example, for clarity's sake, one of the things that I hear a lot is that all kids can succeed, and we say that, but then we say, well, that kid can't really do well on this because of X, Y, or Z. Can you talk about? what that looks like when you actually do the counter narrative from the front of the room and to a group of teachers. Yeah. And I think, again, what's really important is that it's not something that a leader is preaching at teachers, right? It's we hear these statements about students. So yes, all students can learn. We say that and we say, let's have high expectation for students. But then when let's say, you know, Filipino boys are always at the bottom of the achievement data, then Mm -hmm. have a tendency to make excuses for why that's true. Or they don't apply themselves. Those families don't care about education. And there are a lot of ways that they're not actually intellectually capable of doing that. They can't do that kind of thinking or they're not motivated. Right. That's back to the, they don't care. So, We hear these things swirling around the school, right, in the the teacher's lounge or, you know, in meetings. The leader, rather than trying to address 
individual comments in the moment starts a school year off or starts a meeting with here are the three things we believe about our Filipino boys, that they are more than capable, that they have leadership qualities. And despite what society says about them, we know that they are more than capable. And here are the ways that we want to help them build their capacity. And that's a lead in to maybe reading articles or a lead in to student led activities. And that's an ethos then that they will keep coming back around to. And it's a way in which to kind of shift people's thinking. So it's an explicit statement, but it's not said in response to someone else saying something negative. It's actually a proactive statement that people come back around to. Yeah, something that is in anticipation of what somebody might say. And I really like that example because when you get that specific and say, these are the three things we believe about our male Filipino students, then that that changes what people are allowed to get away with saying, right? And I love that. I think that's a that's a great strategy, especially being able to say that proactively before anybody has a chance to say anything that school year, because the reality is they've probably said it for years, right? Yeah. And here's the thing I would add is it's not just a matter of in anticipation of people saying things, but it's looking out into the larger society and seeing how that particular group is marginalized so that the principal doesn't actually have to think about just what's being said in the teacher's lounge, but actually can say, if I look at what's being said in the media about those particular students, if I look at kind of what's the historical pattern of marginalization for those students, then, or for that particular group, then I know what those counter narratives can be. Because teachers in many ways are just mirroring what the larger society is saying about them. They're not making them up. I don't think that teachers have any malice in deficit thinking, right? They're not actively trying to think negatively. They're influenced a lot by the media. They're influenced by the ways that we have bred inequity into our school system. So the leader understands this and rather than be reactive, is actually proactive with the counter narratives and building relational trust. So I'd say a leader who wants to start being culturally responsive in his or her school starts with those two things with at meetings, building the relational trust among the adults in the building and creating a set of counter narratives that everyone then starts to adopt and to say, right, with no prompting. And that you're reading to kind of build people's understanding of why that's true. You're, you're tapping into the wisdom of the local community to actually see where there are strengths and assets that are being utilized and uh, develops that usually are out of the view of teachers, right? Being in the community and connected with the community. So that's that first phase of the work before you're even thinking about instruction. I cut her off right there so that she could finish talking about the first phase. I wanted you to just think about what that looks like in your school and how you can start doing culturally responsive teaching at your school. Next week, she's going to talk about the second phase, which is building the capacity of teachers. And I hope that you take some time to think about what you can start doing now so that next week you're ready to add more and do better. I really appreciate this conversation with her. She really made me think and helped me figure out some things that, that I've been bouncing around in my head. So ready for rigor.com again is her website and we'll pick up with part two next week. Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcast for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.